Hello, welcome to Over 50 and Flourishing. Hope your week is getting off to a great start. Today, we are delving into a topic that I know resonates with virtually everybody tuning in, trust. We do have the honor of hosting Dr. Henry Cloud, a true luminary in the fields of psychology, spirituality, and leadership. With a distinguished career spanning decades, Dr. Cloud is not only a clinical psychologist, but also a guiding light for pastors and leaders worldwide. You might recognize him as the brilliant author behind the internationally acclaimed book, Boundaries, which has touched the lives of millions. Now he's back with his latest masterpiece, Trust, knowing when to give it, when to withhold it, how to earn it, and how to fix it when it gets broken. Join us as we explore the depths of trust and the human connection with one of the most influential voices in mental health and leadership. Spring is here, temperatures are warming up, so don't give BO a chance. Unlike other deodorants, Lumi Whole Body Deodorant is powered by mandelic acid delivers this crazy 72-hour odor control everywhere, and I do mean everywhere. In fact, it was a patient's concern about private part odor that originally inspired the ob who invented Lumi. Fast forward six years later, there are products for every single part. Let me tell you, I personally like the Lumi body wipes. I bring them to work with me. If ever you're feeling not quite so fresh, you can just grab a wipe and take care of things. Lumi starter pack is perfect for new customers. It comes with that solid stick deodorant, cream tube deodorant, two free products of your choice like the mini body wash and the deodorant wipes, and free shipping. As a special offer for my listeners, new customers get 15% off all Lumi products with our exclusive code. And if you combine the 15% off with the already discounted starter pack, that equals to over 40% off their starter pack. Use over 50 for 15% off your first purchase at lumideodorant.com. That's code over 50 at L-U-M-E-D-E-O-D-O-R-A-N-T dot com. Are you like me and you don't like a complicated skincare routine, especially if you're on the go or even when you're traveling? Let me tell you about today's sponsor, One Skin. Their products make it so easy to keep your skin healthy while looking and feeling your best. Like I said, no complicated routine. One Skin is the world's first skin longevity company by focusing on the cellular aspects of aging. One Skin keeps your skin looking and acting younger for longer. Get started today with 15% off using code OVER50 at oneskin.co. That's 15% off oneskin.co with code OVER50. After your purchase, they'll ask where you heard about them. Please support our show. Tell them we sent you. Henry, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm really, really excited to share your new book with our viewers. I'm sure many of whom have read your previous material. Uh, your work is really extraordinary and groundbreaking and honestly eye-opening for so many people to affect change in their lives. But your latest book is called Trust, Knowing When to Give It, When to Withhold It, How to Earn It, and How to Fix It When It Gets Broken. And can I say trust issues <laughs> are among the biggest issues that Oh yeah, see. those. Yeah, those, you know, those things <laughs> called trust issues. Everybody yeah. seems to have them to some degree or another. Um, you know, one of the phrases that I loved in your book, you say trust is the fuel for all of life. Tell me what you mean yeah. by that. It, it's a big statement, right? It but is. I've never, as a psychologist and as a leadership consultant in companies and businesses, so personal lives as well as professional, I've never been called into a situation that no matter what the problem, you start to drill down on it a little bit and pretty soon you're running into some issue of trust, either somebody can't let go of something and let the other person be who they need to be, or they can't enter into, you know, that space of showing up trustworthy themselves where the other person can let go of them. Mm -hmm. And the reason I call it the fuel of life is very simply, nothing works without trust. Mm -hmm. I, I was sitting on an airplane um, when I was writing the book and I was, I was doing some research on trust and the guy next to me says, so what are you doing? I said, well, I'm researching trust. He goes, oh, well, I don't trust anybody. And I said, I said really? He says, he says, no, absolutely. He said, you can't trust people. I learned that a long time ago. You just can't. I only trust myself. 
Mm. And I'm like, well, dude, I'm, I'm a psychologist and I think you're crazy. Right. And so I, said, well, what? I said, look, you're at 40,000 feet. Look out the window. You didn't get yourself up here. Don't tell me you don't trust people. Nothing in life works without trust. You're going to have a very small life if you can't trust. And also you're going to have a very small life if you're not trustworthy because other people aren't going to invest in you and you're not going to be part of anything bigger than yourself. So starting when we are born from the womb to the tomb, trust is the way we scale anything in life. I mean, it, it, Dominic, if I ask you a question, have you been breathing for the last 60 seconds? Yeah, yep. yeah. Why? Because you have an algorithm inside mm-hmm. of your whole system that's always running 24-7. And the first question that it always asks is, am I safe? Mm. And if all the factors come up to hit green, then you can be careless and you're on, you can go do other things and your system just breathes and trusts the air. But as soon as you smelled a gas fume, it would go, whoa, because then you've got to know when not to give trust, maybe run out of the building. Relationships in life are like that. And if we don't have the algorithm working correctly, we breathe some toxic stuff in that we should never be trusting in. But we also don't enter into some things that could expand our lives if we can't trust. It's a big deal. It is. You know, why do you think we have so many trust issues? What's the origin of this? Well, I'll give you the, <laughs> the theological answer. We live in a fallen world. <laughs> but however you look at that, there's, there's a reality in this life we live. And that is that we see beauty and goodness everywhere. It's all around us. You know, this is an incredible world. We have beautiful people, both inside and out, that bring so much to life. And we're wired for trust neurologically, psychologically, emotionally. You have mirror neurons from the time you're a baby that that sense, is it okay? Does does this person care about me? And if you are, you open up and you develop something. So we're wired for this. And there's so many people, oh, I want to. I want to love this person. I want to try. I want to do the business with, you know, I want to trust this, whatever, because it's so good at the same time. It's an imperfect world. And there are some things that have goodness, but we don't look at maybe the germs that live in that food either, or the germs that live in that person or the toxicity involved And we have trust issues because as our trust muscle is developing, then we can either have not had enough goodness to learn that there are good things that I should lean into and open up to, or we've had enough hurt and woundedness Mm -hmm. that we've gotten a view of the world for good reason, like that man on the airplane well, I don't trust anybody. And when I said to him, well, I'd like to hear your story because I bet there's been some key betrayals somewhere that have caused you to come to that view. But as I heard his story, there was also some broken life parts to it that the inability to trust had not, you know, afforded him to not have. So we have it because in large view, or in, in large order, our experiences and also our skills that we currently have of when to hit go and when to hit not go. Are some people innately more trusting and trustworthy versus others, or is it all tied back to wounding from the past? Well, I, you know, it's it's kind of the the true nature nurture problem. Um, Yes, some people are, you know, if you've ever, do you have kids? You've had kids, right? Yeah. Well, did you visit the nursery when you went to the hospital and you look in the aquarium there, you know, all the little babies are wrapped up in their burritos. (laughs) You look through the window and they're lying there. That's my burrito. (laughs) That's right. And and one of them is like, ah. And they're happy. They just like the world like they found. And the next one right next to them is like, (laughs) I always say 
those are the future attorneys of the world, right? <laughs> you can spot them it right away. <laughs> you can spot them. It's a temperament thing. And some people mm -hmm. are in their temperament, you know, personality type, typology tests show this. Some people are more naturally kind of, I'm going to go with what I find. Mm -hmm. And other people are more against as their first stance. And it takes a while to get there. So some of it is temperament, but by and large, even either of those temperaments, given the right experiences, can develop a balanced, good, integrated trust muscle. But you give them the wrong experiences on either one of them. Generally, the more accepted ones will become more avoidant if they've been hurt. The more aggressively endowed will, you know, fight or flight. Well, instead of flight, they'll fight. And that breaks a lot of trust in subsequent relationships. So it is both. You always have to look at how am I wired and what am I doing with what's happened to me? But, but you know, wiring is changeable in a way too. Mm. You know, from we've all read about neuroplasticity. Well, new experiences actually can all the way to, to our DNA. And I mean, we, that's why we grow because we can fundamentally change. And that's why we believe in growth and work so hard on it. I love how you say that. I'm a believer in that too. I do think that you can rewire your thoughts, your decisions, and, and choices that you made in your past don't have to affect you in the future. But in order to do that, don't you have to trust? Don't you have to put yourself out there and to do the thing that seems so counterintuitive? Ah, don't say that. <laughs> the problem is the solution, right? No, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. Because what we're talking about in a lot of trust issues is we're talking about a very complicated, um, deep activation of the entire fear system. Mm -hmm. And so everybody's heard of amygdala hijacking and all of this stuff. But when, when some people are walking around with an activated, um, have you ever been asleep at night and all of a sudden car alarms are going off down the street? Mm -hmm because a big trash truck drove down the street. Well, those alarms are set to, you know, they're like too, um, they're hypersensitive. Yes. Well, some people, their system is kind of hypervigilant is what we call mm -hmm. it. And, and they've had trauma or whatever. And a little vibration will send them away. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and sometimes you're exactly right. Psychologists have a term for this. It's called the need fear dilemma. Now, here's where we are totally, just totally in a bad corner. The less we trust, the less needs we're having met. So the less needs we have met, the more I need. The more I need, the more vulnerable I am. The more vulnerable I am, the more fearful I am because I can really get hurt. And the only way out of that is through. The only way out of that is to reduce the need by receiving and getting some comfort and, and good experiences. But you, to do that, you got to risk and that's the most vulnerable. So right. this is why people shouldn't, for example, when, when you've, you've got trust issues, you don't go, you don't go to Vegas and put it all on red. I mean, you don't, you know, bet the farm on this next new relationship you meet, you've got to get in some sort of a healing environment first, a safe place. It might even begin with a, with a therapist or a support group or a couple of friends where you've got to rebuild that muscle in very, very small incremental steps. But as you do that, it gets stronger. And just like we help an agoraphobic one day end up driving on the freeway, you didn't do that in day one, but you'll never do it without doing something that's fearful in the beginning. Just do it in a good, safe place. Nice. Yes. Small choices can affect big change if done habitually right. and, and in patterns. This is, oh my gosh, this and, conversation. And, and in a good place. And in a good place. You're right. And this, you know, we're going to take a quick break and thank our sponsors, but what's so amazing, wonderful, and yet scary for a lot of people about trust is this applies to every facet of our lives, our hmm. personal relationships, our relationships at work with coworkers, with colleagues, with business. I mean, everything is rooted in trust. And if we struggle in this issue, we struggle 
in every area of our life. So Henry, I'm so glad you've written this book. This is what we are talking about today. It is trust and we're gonna help you get it. Stay with us right after this break. Spring is here, temperatures are warming up, so don't give BO a chance. Unlike other deodorants, Lumi Whole Body Deodorant is powered by mandelic acid. Delivers this crazy 72-hour odor control everywhere, and I do mean everywhere. In fact, it was a patient's concern about private part odor that originally inspired the ob who invented Lumi. Fast forward six years later, there are products for every single part. Let me tell you, I personally like the Lumi body wipes. I bring them to work with me. If ever you're feeling not quite so fresh, you can just grab a wipe and take care of things. But there are so many other products that they have. They are baking soda-free, paraben-free, pH-balanced, safe to use below the belt, and you've got all kinds of scents like clean tangerine, lavender sage, and toasted coconut. Lumi Starter Pack is perfect for new customers. It comes with that solid stick deodorant, cream tube deodorant, two free products of your choice like the mini body wash and the deodorant wipes, and free shipping. As a special offer for my listeners, new customers get 15% off all Lumi products with our exclusive code. And if you combine the 15% off with the already discounted starter pack, that equals to over 40% off their starter pack. Use over 50 for 15% off your first purchase at lumideodorant.com. That's code over 50 at L-U-M-E-D-E-O-D-O-R-A-N-T.com. Welcome back. Our guest today is Dr. Henry Cloud, a, uh, an esteemed psychologist who's written numerous books on the human condition, I will say. Uh, trust is your latest subject. It's an area, Henry, where so many people struggle. And you were talking about the roots of that struggle and points of origin. And I, I love how you brought into the equation that some people are just wired differently. Some people are innately more trustworthy than others. True. And oftentimes a lot of that wiring too has to do with our past, how we were raised, experiences in childhood, and all of these things shape us into the adults that we are and the decisions that we make. And, and you know, past is a big word. A lot, a lot of times mm -hmm. we'll, you know, it's true. Our formative years, obviously, mm -hmm. is where the concrete is wet and it gets, you know, pretty formed. But a lot of people, you know, trust issues they came into adulthood pretty innocently and ended up, what, what if you end up marrying a toxic narcissist, mm -hmm. for example? Well, a healthy trust muscle can also be destroyed by later relationships in life or even in somebody's career. I've seen people move into, I do a lot of work with leadership teams and in team formation, somebody's joined the team and they don't, they're not operating like the rest of the team does in this good, good culture that it's in. And their last boss almost did them in. And so they've got to be sort of rebooted again. And it's stuff that happened even in adulthood. I'm glad you brought that up because I think that can be a real shock to the system for somebody who has really never experienced major trust problems in the past to suddenly come into adulthood, have these types of experiences and traumas and really start to question their own trustworthiness. And why, why did I bring this into my life? Why did I allow this to happen? Why was I so blindsided by it when I was seemingly healthy? The sad thing is, and, and this is, I, I hate this reality, but loving, responsible people kind of make a classic error over and over and over. They just assume that everybody's like them. Right. Meaning, how do they act? Well, they, they try to extend kindness, their understanding. Mm -hmm. They take responsibility for their side. Somebody's, they step on somebody's toe. The other person goes, well, you didn't. oh, I'm so sorry. I won't do that again. So then... They think other people are like that, and some are, but some aren't. I mean, there are some people that are not trustworthy, and they get into a relationship there, and because they're so empathic and responsible, the first default assumption is, oh, well, what did I do wrong? What, did I, what do I need? To, how did I cause it? And there's a lot of self-blame that actually can sometimes keep them from getting to the next step of growth, which is, wait a minute, maybe 
maybe my people pick her. Maybe everybody's not trustworthy. Maybe I need to get the lenses kind of, you know, corrected here a little bit where I'm learning when to hit go and when not to, because some people are not trustworthy. And there are some people in between. There's some areas of life we can be vulnerable with and give to them and some areas we're going to hold close to the vest. So it's a skill we build. Yes, I would agree with that. I mean, by nature, I'm a very trustworthy person and have brought things and situations into my life where I probably ignored red flags that were there in the name of, of the benefit of the doubt or maybe not wanting oh, to gosh. work with others, right? <laughs> I, was, I was around some people the other day as actually in a, a leadership context and they said, well, you know, we always want to believe the best. And I go, whoa, why? Why don't you believe what's real? Yes. And sometimes it's the best and then you invest more. Sometimes what's really going on here is not something you should invest more of yourself in. So I don't, you know, if somebody comes up and punches you, the benefit of the doubt was, well, they've got a neurological condition that made them, you know, involuntarily hit you. Well, that could happen, but let's at least examine it because you might be dealing with a mean person mm -hmm. who smiles a lot. So let's, let's not always believe the best automatically. Let's be open to whatever is going to be there and then make diligent choices on, based on what we find. Henry, is this a thing, people with trust issues not recognizing that they have trust issues? Oh, yeah. Oh, totally. I, I, classic example is, and I think I tell the story um, in the book, there's a business example of this. There's a personal life example from this guy. I'll never forget this. He, he, was, uh, he, he was getting, you know, he's single, but well into his 30s. And... <clears throat> kept dating and getting into, you know, somewhat significant relationships with call it by this time, maybe four or five different wonderful women, nothing wrong with them would have hit all the checklist buttons that, and, and his friends kept going "Dude, what is your problem? But he'd always find the closer he got, he'd find something wrong with them. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, she's just this, or she's just that. And, and I remember he came in and he was trying to decide, is this the one, you know? And he was increasingly finding her controlling is the way, is the word he used. And so I'm asking about these situations and I go, you know, what you're describing as controlling, what you're, that's actually, she's requesting that you like show up and talk <laughs> or <laughs> like maybe, maybe give some time to the relationship every now and then instead of go do. And, but he would, he would experience this as controlling. Well, I said, you know, dude, the last thing you need to do is ditch this one and find the next one. Let's just hit pause. Cause I think your trust button here has some work to do. So we get into kind of how that was constructed and we'll go into his whole history and everything, but he had a very too overly tuned in your words, oversensitive radar about losing his freedom and his autonomy and somebody who's going to control him and smother him and, you know, end his life just because he's in a relationship. And so that had to be worked with. Well, we start working with this and all of a sudden this quote controlling woman turns into a wonderful, giving, lovely person. I say all of a sudden it took some work. She hadn't changed a bit. Hmm. He just had, a trust muscle issue that he had to work with. And you see that in business, you see it in personal lives. We don't, you know, we don't see people clearly all sorts, sorts of research shows that. And the more we can get to 2020 vision on ourselves and others, that's the definition of emotional intelligence, self-awareness and other awareness, then we're going to do better. So you're saying trust issues can be fixed because I know people oh, yeah. say that, you know, people who have, or come from narcissism or demonstrate narcissism that may not be fixable, but this is fixable. Oh, wait, my hair catches on fire when I use this, or, or when I hear this. I, I will get calls on a call-in show, for example, 
And somebody would say, well, you know, my therapist said that, that my boyfriend and my husband is a narcissist and they don't ever change. So I'm going to ditch him or I'm going to divorce him or whatever. I go, wait a minute, stop. I don't know who your therapist is, but we've been treating narcissism for decades. Narcissistic people can change. A. B. Narcissistic people don't always change. But there are paths that you can take that can reveal whether or not they can or will change. And thirdly, all narcissists are not the same. What kind of narcissist does your therapist say this person is? They go, well, what do you mean? They're narcissistic. I go, are they envy-based narcissism? Is there envy-based narcissism or is it shame-based? They're very different. And you deal with one in a very different way than you do the other. So to your point, people can change. But what I, in, in working with both sides of this scenario, I always tell the one that's got to make the trust move after they've been betrayed, maybe there's been an affair or some failure. And they go, well, well I don't, I, how do I know if I can trust again? I go, look, the last thing you can do is try to be a crystal ball, you know, for, fortune teller. You, you can't be doing that. What we've got to do, we've got to have some objective kinds of criteria, a path, and you're going to sit in the bleachers and you're going to watch them. And when they are illustrating different kinds of trustworthy behaviors in very objective areas, you don't have to guess. That's when you hit go. But if you're not seeing that, to take a risk based on nothing, that's not hope. That's wishing. Mm -hmm. You know, hope is objective and you can have hope if you're seeing the right things. Right. And thank you, by the way, for sharing that there are no absolutes. There seem to be out there, and I don't know why or where this has come from. Maybe it's trendy scrolling on the TikTok feed. You know, everywhere you look, it's narcissism this, nar trust issues that. You can't fix him, he can't figure, he or she can't fix himself or herself and move on type thing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a true believer that if we all try hard enough, and I'm a woman of faith and include prayer in that as well with effort, then I think anything is anything can happen, you know, anything so, can, anything can. And sometimes and often it doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, even, I mean, even if you went to the faith side of this, look, God has the same problem. <laughs> he, he kind of says, Hey, I want to, I want to be friends with everybody. Some, some wake up and have an awakening. Others don't. You can't ever control the other side. And so when you say, I can't change him, you're exactly right. What you can do, though, is you can have the ingredients present from your side of the equation that if it is going to be possible for them to change and if they are going to be willing, then that's how it's going to happen. And so we'll never know until we let them self-select out. So we're going to give the gates that they got to go through. If they go through gate, then problem solved with a lot of work. But if they don't, then they don't. And so it's, it's not true that people can't change. It is true that people can change. It's not true that everybody can or will. And that's the hard work of this. Right. And also, you know, you talk about hope. There may be a lot of women listening right now and their partner or spouse has trust issues and it's impacting the relationship. So there's hope that that person can change, but A, are they willing? And B, how long is it going to take? And will the relationship endure that time span? Yeah. What have you seen? Well, there's some factors that, you know, any psychologist would look at to begin with. Um, and, 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 and this is where I think you really, I, I wrote a book called Necessary Endings, because to your point, there are times when changes aren't going to happen. And so continue to have hope is a great virtue, but when you're down a wrong road, hoping that it's going to turn into the right road is not a good virtue to have in that context. So there are some things that, that are necessary for them to end, but we should have hope 
if we have reason to hope. Otherwise, it's a wish. See, hope has objective reasons to place hope. So what, and, and I, you know, we could go deeply in the, in the book. I even actually talk about this, but what a psychologist would listen for in from session number one, does the person own that they have a problem? Mm-hmm. You know, if, if, if the guy that I talked about earlier If he keeps thinking it's these women that are too controlling or, you know, they're too this or too that, he's stuck for life. And I would, if they came in, I'd say, get rid of this guy. He's, you know, there's no way it's going to work. But if he could say, you know what, I've gone through four or five relationships and I'm starting to see there was nothing wrong with me. I've got a problem here. Mm -hmm. Or if they come in and say, you know, my wife, um, she tells me I have trust issues. I, I think she might be right, or I'd like to at least explore that, you know? So you can't fix a problem you don't have. So the first thing we got to see is what capacity do they have to admit they've got a problem? Now, sometimes they don't, and this is where really good boundaries come in because somebody that's, that's, you know, not owning a problem, very good limits and consequences can give them an invitation to wake up and say, I might not think I had a problem, but everybody in my life is walking out on me. Maybe I got a problem or she's going to separate until I go get help or something. So that's number one. Can they own it? Number two, can they express a need for help? Mm -hmm. The term self-help is an oxymoron. I mean, we change because we reach our limit of being able to pull it off ourselves. And we need to take in some stuff from the outside, usually good support and energy as well as some intelligence. And so can they say, I got a problem, but I've, I've tried, I think I need some help. Mm -hmm. Will they go see a counselor? Will they go into marriage counseling with you? If they fired the last three, because they're so narcissistic that they think they know better than every counselor, will they say, wow, that's a problem. Maybe I need to stick with the next one. Can they see that they have a problem and will they seek help? Number three, is the help they're getting some sort of proven process of change? You know, they're saying, well, I'm going to meet with my golfing buddies and they're going to help me because, you know, in my marriage, probably not. But if one of your golfing buddies is, you know, John Gottman, (laughs) the greatest marriage researcher, we know, yeah, go play golf with John. (laughs) So who are they talking to and what the heck do they bring to the party? Right. And then, and then are they really utilizing that? One of the things you really want to look for is do they have a personal drive to get better for themselves? Mm-hmm. You know, you can tell when an addict, like the whole thing, people don't change. Are you kidding me? How many people go from addicted to sober? Mm-hmm. I just, just did a, a show just earlier today with, somebody that's going into um, a career becoming an addiction specialist after being an addict for 17 years. And they've been sober for almost that many now. So don't tell me people don't change. But also, Mm -hmm. when you look at addicts that change, there are those that have to be, everybody's trying to get them to go to their meetings, get them to go to the therapist or get them to go. That's not what you see in people that change. People that change say, I need to get to my meeting. I need to call my counselor. I can't miss my appointment. And they have a drive. When they are more concerned with their getting better than you are, then that becomes a little more trustworthy. And then are they developing the skills that they need? And are you seeing some change? There's ways to know this. Yes. And I think, you know, so many people think, and I think, Books like yours are the door opener, the identifiers, the knowledge, the base, the understanding. But to your point, so many of us need to go further in that exploration and to find that source and to find that person who's qualified to be able to take us there. And I think that often is the step that's missed. People think, well, I can just read my way through it or, you know, that's all I need. And I don't know, there's there's this fear and phobia of counseling and and talking to someone. It's as if, oh, well, I'm acknowledging that I failed. 
and that's not the right. case. So we'll talk a little bit more. You've got some great ways to identify, understand trust issues in all areas of life. And I really want to just flush this out with you on the backside of this commercial break. Dr. Henry Cloud, I'm so glad you're with us today. Are you like me and you don't like a complicated skincare routine, especially if you're on the go or even when you're traveling? Let me tell you about today's sponsor, One Skin. Their products make it so easy to keep your skin healthy while looking and feeling your best. Like I said, no complicated routine, no multi-step protocols, just simple, scientifically validated solutions. Now, their One Skin proprietary OS1 peptide is the ingredient that has all the magic. It is the first ingredient proven to switch off the aging cells that cause lines, wrinkles, and thinning skin. Personally, I love OS1 Face and OS1 Eye. It's that simple. A product for the face, a product for the eye. And that's it. Takes care of everything. One Skin is the world's first skin longevity company by focusing on the cellular aspects of aging. One Skin keeps your skin looking and acting younger for longer. Get started today with 15% off using code OVER50 at oneskin.co. That's 15% off oneskin.co. .co with code over 50. After your purchase, they'll ask where you heard about them. Please support our show. Tell them we sent you. Back with us, Dr. Henry Cloud, esteemed author. His new book is called Trust, Knowing When to Give It, When to Withhold It, How to Earn It, and How to Fix It When It Gets Broken. We've been talking trust issues all day on Over 50 and Flourishing. And my goodness, I've, you know, I've experienced my own in relationships. Uh, I've experienced it toward me. I've seen friends deal with it. Nobody is immune. So let's, let's, First of all, put it that way, either as the giver or the receiver in a trust issue situation, we all go through it. So I think to your point, it's about identifying in different situations, relationships, work uh, environments, um, how to identify and how to handle when we're in it. So you listed a bunch of things toward the beginning of your book that you would dive into throughout the chapters. One I would like to ask you is explain how to understand the value of trust in every aspect of life and then to prioritize it in our efforts to be successful in both love and life. And life also includes the workplace and other things that we do outside our personal relationship. You know, in the beginning, we talked about how like all of life runs on trust. You know, mm -hmm. when when a baby comes into the world, um, they they don't turn around to mom and go, sorry, mom, is that hard on you? Can I, can I get you anything? You know, no, right. <laughs> they, they pop out and turn around and they're like, wee, wee, wee. and and what you see on their faces, they're in hell. I sure. mean, literally weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's just, well, why are they in that experience? And here's why, because for the first time in their entire existence, they are separated from life. See, they were connected in a very trusting relationship inside that womb. Mm -hmm. They didn't even have to think about it. Everything was regulated for them, their hunger, their comfort, their distress, their immune system, all of that. Well, now they find themselves a separate person. They are without what they need. So what's got to happen is the doctor's got to bring them back and all of a sudden, this relationship begins to form literally of trust. And that baby and the mother are wired with mirror neurons, neurological, psychological, emotional systems that are reading every millisecond that baby's going, am I safe? And what happens is they're in distress and they're upset. And, they're, and what happens? The mom or the caretaker reads that very empathically, attuned to them, and responds accordingly and through tone and being present. Oh, you're upset. It's okay. It's okay. And they, they calm down and that baby's getting a sense. Oh, oh, this is good. <laughs> I want more. And they're opening up and they're starting to make an investment. Now, what that investment is, is a connection. Just like when your computer is on Wi-Fi, when you're on the connection, you're downloading software. You're downloading energy. You're downloading support. And the baby's taking all that in. They're getting what they need from the outside. Basically, in two ways, they're getting energy 
to support them and they're getting intelligence to make that work. Well, gradually, if they're getting that connection, they're growing. Mm -hmm. Now, babies that don't have the connection, they go into something we call failure to thrive syndrome. They can have their physical needs met, but not their emotional trusting connections, secure attachment where all this is downloaded and their, their brain sizes are smaller. Their immune systems don't work. Their IQs are lower later. They have all sorts of issues at, you know, some age, they start to, ones that raise an institution start to have behavior problems. We hook up their brains to a scan and they've got black holes up there where wiring didn't grow because of the absence of a trusting attachment. Now that goes throughout life, literally throughout life that, that, I mean, how many times has, have you yourself or a friend, you're in a bad state, right? You've gone through something traumatic or something painful. Your friend comes or your loved one or your spouse or a therapist or somebody and they're attuned and they're empathic, they're with you. And all of a sudden your system begins to slow down. Mm -hmm. You're able to process the pain. The fear goes down. See, we get this from outside of ourselves. So if we don't have the ability for A, to have some trustworthiness outside of us in key relationships and the ability to join in and invest, then we're not downloading what we need to live life. Mm -hmm. And that's why when people grieve, we want them around people that can help. It's why people start out in a new career or job or whatever you don't throw them out there without some sort of coaching and development and training and metabolizing the failure and all that stuff. We need each other. And the trust muscle drives all of that. The problem is we need to know how to hit go. Who do we trust? Like the subtitle of the book, when to give it, when to give trust, but when to withhold it. Mm -hmm. Also, how do we earn it? And then what do we do when it gets broken? Those are skills yeah. that, we really need in life to make it work. To your point, how do we determine who is trustworthy and who isn't? And is that determination something that we can discern quickly or does it take time? Boy, that's a, that's a, I could write a book on that, so to speak. <laughs> that's there you go. The it's big question, good. right? I know. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, the reason, the reason I actually wrote it was, um, a, we need it, but B, it is doable. I mean, you, 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 your system is already wired to do this. It's just sometimes we get hurt or broken or, you know, whatever, and we need to kind of get better at it. Mm -hmm. And to your point of does it happen in an instant or does it take time, you know, there are people that um, have highly, highly developed uh, trust radar. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean they're hypervigilant and scared. I mean, they're highly developed in that they have learned pattern recognition. They've learned, you know, what is, I mean, how many times have you had a single friend, for example, and <clears throat> they go, I met the one and you go, oh, we got to meet him. And, you know, and then finally that you have that dinner and they bring them and then the guy leaves or the woman leaves and you turn to your friends and go, what are you thinking? And they go, what? <laughs> They don't see it, but you do in an right. instant. Right. And they've been dating for a month, but, but you know, they're on a drug trip from bonding chemicals going off. Dopamine in their and all of that fun stuff. That's right. Oxytocin and all of yes. that, you know, stuff that, well, you saw it in an instant. So the more highly developed we can get. And in the book, I, I what I did was I did a factor analysis of all the research in the world on trust and, it kind of falls into five buckets. And here's the problem. We as humans, we tend to be good at maybe a couple of these, but overlooked a couple of them, or um, we've been wounded in a couple of them. And if we can kind of know what do I look for and make sure that's there, whether it's in an instant or it takes a little bit of a process, because sometimes trust is not immediately discernible. And we need to have a little more experience until we hit go. But we can learn how to do this. 
Yeah. I mean, isn't it interesting that that dopamine rush can absolutely cloud your judgment when it comes to trusting? Oh. I've seen that happen time and time again, where people see things and you just simply don't. So how do we, how do we kind of wipe the fog <laughs> off the windshield, get it clean so that we can make that discernment for ourselves? Because we're not going to listen to what our friends say. We're like, nah, you don't know. <laughs> yeah, you don't know. I mean, yeah, we, I mean, seriously, it is a literal drug trip. I mean, your yes. brain is producing opioids almost. It's like, mm -hmm. so you don't, you know, see clearly. Um, so how do we, what do we look for? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. I mean, how do we get past that whole chemical rush to be able to see clearly? Yeah. How do we clean the fog off of the windshield? Well, I'm a big believer in that you don't make all the decisions with your heart, mm -hmm. nor do you make all the decisions with your brain. Mm -hmm. It's pretty good when your heart and your brain have a good relationship and they're talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's really good to, um, to know that, that chemistry and emotions are very, very important. Even in work scenarios, you want to, we want a team to have good chemistry with each other. We want it to, mm -hmm. to be, to be passionate and invigorating and I want to be there and all of that. But there's also got to be some objective reasons why, what does this person bring to the party and how do they work with the other people on the team? So what I did in the book was I, I talk about five areas. Number one, we trust someone and someone is trustworthy when they understand us. What I mean by that is, I can trust you if I get a sense that you get me, you know what I need, mm -hmm. you know what hurts me, you know what makes me thrive, you know what makes me happy, you know what I'm afraid of. And when you really understand me, that's that first level of just tuning into somebody where they feel, oh, she's she gets it. I've been trying, how many times in a, in a marriage, have you heard somebody say, you know, I don't know what happened. They, I came home and there was a note after 10 years she says she's leaving. She can't tell you what she talking about. And you go, she's been trying to tell you for 10 years. You're not getting it. You're not hearing her. You're not listening. So we begin to trust, even in difficult situations, when somebody finally goes, oh, that's horrible. I didn't know it made you feel that way. Tell me more. And you really start to, not that only that, you know, somebody didn't trust us when we understand them. They trust us when they understand that we understand. It's yes. a loop. Yes. When they begin to feel really heard and really gotten, that's the first button. You got a conflict was, with a teenage? Go, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was going to say, uh, this so resonates with me, and there is an indescribable peace that comes from what you speak of being felt and heard, and you feel safe. You feel it's as if your nervous system relaxes. It lets go. Yeah, it lets go. You feel yourself like, oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you kind of lean into it. You know, I was, I was talking about this at a leadership event one time, and and a guy walks up to me afterwards. He says, I'm the chief hostage negotiator for the FBI. I'm the guy they send in when, when the guy's got a bomb strapped to him and 30 hostages in a bank. He said, everything you just talked about is our entire training program. Mm. We don't walk into a bank and try to convince somebody to trust us. You know, the, the, the bomber. Dude, this is a bad idea. This doesn't, no, you don't do that. You walk in and say, hey, I'm Henry. They sent me in here to talk to you. What's your name? And you get the name. They say, so, so tell me, George, how did we get here today? What's been happening? What's going on? And they just listen. Like and then the more they listen, the more begins to come out. And the more it comes out that they listen, the person feels understood first. Well, nothing's resolved yet, but the communication lines are open. Mm -hmm. that's number one. You're not going to, you got an acting out teenager. You're not going to, going to fix them just even though limits and boundaries are a book on that. I mean, it's important, <laughs> but 
they're not going to hear those or receive those if they don't feel first heard. You don't understand me. You don't know what it's like to school. You don't know the bullies I have to deal with. You don't know. And we need to know. And we need to make sure they know that we know. That's when we start to to get it. A boss needs to really understand what's it like to have to pull off what they're asking somebody to pull off. And does that person know that the boss gets it, that they've got, you know, full understanding of what it's like for them. So that's number one. Well, number two, you know, predators make people feel understood. They'll go seduce them with deep empathy and, oh, and I'm so, this is how a lot of affairs start. You know, mm-hmm. somebody's complaining about their marriage, somebody that worked, they're so deeply understanding. I've never felt understood like this. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, you're being understood, but do they have this second component? What's their motive? Right. What's their agenda? Somebody can understand us, but they're also understanding us and to connecting with us to use us. Versus does somebody feel like this other person understands me and they also are for my best interests. Mm -hmm. Now, certainly they have their own, own needs and all of that, but in a relationship, if both parties don't feel like the other one has their back and they're really looking out for how it works for them, how the way I'm behaving in our relationship, is that good for you as well as me? We trust somebody when we feel like they can get past their own interests and also have the interests of me as well. You know, I, sometimes I use the example in in a marriage. Um, like, let's say I'm out and um, and somebody says, "Hey, you want to play golf on Saturday?" And I look at my phone. I'm like, "Yeah, I can do that." Let's let's. Mm-hmm. Play. Well, that's one thing, but. It's very different than which I learned (laughs) early in marriage. You know what? I I might be able to, let me check with Tori and see what her schedule is and, you know, kind of how that's going to affect us and the kids and all that. And I'll get back to you. Just the very feeling of that. I've got to be thinking about how something's going to affect somebody else who's not at the table. That really helps with trust to know that, my motive is not just going to be about me. It's going to be about us and about her. And same thing in a, in a business, you know, you're trying to sell somebody something, but you can illustrate to them how, you know, I was thinking about your business and I think this, this might be better for you to do. And we get that feeling that somebody has our back and our interests as well as their own. That's the second button. Now we're, now we're really more interested in listening to what they're saying. Mm-hmm. How many times have you ever got an email? And so I says, oh, I got a great opportunity for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Depends yeah. on who that comes from, right? Sure. What do you feel? What do you feel when you, when you hear that? Yeah. Initial somebody, excitement. Yeah. Initial excitement from somebody you trust. Correct. Gosh, they came across something. They thought about me. This is going to be good for me. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I got an opportunity for you. You know who it's for. See, I told They've you I was got an agenda. <laughs> <laughs> How many times have you been on, in a group? Somebody, the group's trying to drive something forward, but one person's every input is really about their agenda and the way mm-hmm. they want it to go. They can't get past themselves. So the motive is a big deal. But we can have good understanding and good motives and still not hit the trust button in a particular context. Give an example. I wrote about this in the book. I had two knee replacements in the past few years and looking for doctors. Um, what if I had gone to a doctor who's really empathic and understanding? Gosh, the pain is terrible. Tell me more. Where does it start? And I feel really listened to. And then he says, well, We got to get you back on the golf course. And you got two daughters. I want you out there tromping with them and and going on, on walks. And, he said, and I'm feeling like he really is. His motive is not just to get paid. He really cares about my life. He gets happy when I do better. That's great. Okay, doc, I trust you. Great, let's go do the surgery. And then he says, and I'm really excited about doing your knee because I'm an OB-GYN. I've never done a knee before. This is really going to be fun. Well, whoa. (laughs) 
Now we've hit the third button. Uh -huh. Do they have the capacity to pull off what I'm entrusting to them? And we can trust somebody in the other dimensions, but maybe we're going to move into a new context. And they don't really have the ability to pull off what is going to be required for that context. You see this in all sorts of areas of life. Sometimes friends are great friends and they go into business together. Well, the person was really trustworthy as a friend, but you get six months into it. They don't know schmutz about running a business and now you're right. in trouble. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I had a friend that his, um, his, uh, daughter's boyfriend called him and he said, I need some advice. So I said, what? He said, well, the boyfriend called me and asked me to go to dinner. I know what this is going to be about. He's going to ask for a hand in marriage. He said, what do you say in that conversation? I said, well, I have two daughters. I know what I'm going to do. He said, what? And I said, I'm going to tell him to show up with his last two years tax returns. <laughs> he goes, yeah, right. You're, I said, I'm dead okay. serious. I am <laughs> dead serious. He says, that's so intrusive. I said, I don't care if he wipes out the numbers. I just want to know if he can find them. Do they exist? Mm. Because the job description of being a boyfriend who can be very caring and concerned for her welfare and all of that versus the job description of being a husband, somebody that she's going to merge her life with, can't, does he have the ability to manage life? Because that's what the, the boat she's going to be riding on. They're going to be together in this thing. So whatever the context does somebody have the skills that are going to be needed to, to pull that off? Personal Maybe sometimes or... we're afraid, Henry, to ask for those things in the name yeah. of being too intrusive or cold or not trusting. <laughs> that's right. And you know what? You just said something that's really, really big. A lot of times you'll ask a question. How many times have you ever heard that? What are you questioning my integrity? You don't trust me? Mm -hmm. I always say, well, not now, not after that. <laughs> right. Because you're getting a response there mm -hmm. that somebody finds it offensive that they're questioned. That's so narcissistic and entitled, like I'm entitled to your trust. Mm -hmm. Well, that's yeah. a big red flag. We want to be in relationships with people that, gosh, this didn't seem right or that hurt. Or, and, and how did that, how did that happen? You said you were going to be here, but I saw, I go, oh gosh, I'm sorry. Good question. I mean, and then we ought to, we ought, if we're trustworthy, we ought to be able to be questioned and provide good, honest reassurance for somebody. So we're not creating a barrier, but if we demand trust and get offended, then no, that doesn't work. I was going to say, you know, for those who have experienced trust problems, have been betrayed in different ways, and people immediately think betrayal, it's, you know, sexual in a relationship, but it can be financial betrayal. It could be uh, words spoken about you behind your back. It could, it could be numerous things where people have broken trust. And I know so many people, so many women, have been hurt in the process and they'll say things like, well, I'll never marry again, or I'll never, yeah. I'll never do that again. How do we prevent other people's wrongdoing in our lives? Stop us from not living and moving forward in life? Because I see a lot of times people putting up roadblocks because of that pain. Absolutely. Well, are you talking about how do we deal with them when they're taking that stance? How do we, how do friends? we, deal, yeah. How do we deal with them and how do we move forward? Well, I would, you know, if I hear that from somebody, I immediately think, whoa, tell me what happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, to go to a restaurant and get food poisoning and say, I'll never eat again. <laughs> it must have been pretty bad, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's not a good plan for life. Right. So the first thing back to trust is I would want to have them feel understood. And I'd say, what in the world happened? And I would want to hear that story mm -hmm. so they know. And when you're doing that, 
it, you know, neurologically, psychologically, when you're getting them to put objective words to what actually happened, it happens, happened, then over a process, that process of metabolizing all of that and, and working through that, it's going to begin to have some little objective pockets to it. Mm-hmm. And they say, well, they, you know, they're always, well, what does always mean? Give me an example. And you're getting them to, to make it specific. The more specificity about these are the things that hurt me. Oh, there's 10 of those. Really? That's one thing. Here's 10 instances, but here's the trait that you're really talking about. Then they start to feel like, oh, well, that's what I don't trust. It's not that I don't trust shrimp. I can't eat shrimp that tastes like sulfur, right? <laughs> so right, right. They've, they've, well, you, you don't want them to exit life. It's fine to never get married again. But are you not getting married again based on really purposeful decisions that that best meets the purpose of your life and your heart and the life you want to build and all of this versus a defensive posture because I'm scared. When we, when we have a life that's built on fear, options decrease. Now, you're not going to get hurt as much, but... You know, I think it was somebody said, you know, um, how did it go? Um, Reality is a hard place to live, but it's the only place you can get a good steak. And and so it's an immature personality organization by definition. If you take borderlines and narcissists and and what we call personality disorders, they're driven in part by a um, mechanism called splitting Mm -hmm. and splitting is when somebody divides the world into good or bad. And the good is that which makes me feel good and is gratifying. The bad is anything. So that's how they can fall in love and be enamored with this person until they do something wrong. And then they're, he's an idiot. I can't believe, you know, Mm -hmm. and so they have very unstable lives. A mature life is one where we've integrated good and bad. And we can see the world as a place where there's great goodness and there's also danger. And we're also being able to be integrated within ourselves to be able to deal with that and with wisdom and discernment and impulse control and investment, pull all that together and find a good steak in a real world. Or if you're vegan, whatever vegans eat. Okay. (laughs) Okay, there you go. Henry, honestly, I feel like we all just got a great hour of therapy today. I could listen to you. You have the most calming, wonderful way of presenting all your information uh, and your book. You're very kind. Uh, well, I'm just being truthful. And I know this book is going to impact so many people to, to ignite so many important thoughts and conversations and hopefully lead people down a path to either be trusting and trustworthy um, because you're right. It is the fuel for all of life. And I'm so grateful you were with us today. Well, it was a real pleasure. And having experienced it, I trust you now to do interviews. So you call me anytime you want to. Oh, well, good. (laughs) Then consider it done. I'll be blowing up your phone. (laughs) Really enjoyed it. See you next time. Oh, thank you so much. Great to have you. So great having Dr. Cloud with us today. So insightful, grateful for his wisdom. I certainly hope you got many, many takeaways from this book, and hopefully we can mitigate and reduce the trust issues that we have in our lives. If you are watching us on YouTube, please comment. Tell us what you thought about today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Share us with those you know and love. And speaking of, if you are listening wherever you listen to your podcast, whether Apple, Spotify, you name it, please rate, review, subscribe, and share Over 50 and Flourishing. It would mean the world to me. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.